Bioshock was groundbreaking in many regards when it released in 2007, though fundamentally it shared many consistencies with the rational System Shock series. What elements of System Shock translated into Bioshock, and what was refined, altered, and innovated upon to create the world of Rapture? Let's take a look at the long road from System Shock to Bioshock. Everyone knows where the game ended up, but uh, I think fans would be interested to learn where this game or, or the idea of doing this game started. And I think you know, folks know System Shock and the, the legacy of that game, huge fan base. Did this game, did it start as a System Shock game initially? No, I mean, because okay. we, we didn't have, we didn't have the, the, right. the rights to that, yeah. right? We kind of felt that um, there was more game design to, to mine there, you know, that it was sort of, we did that one game and it was sort of the first game that really combined shooting and RPG. And it was a very small budget, you know, it was a very small team and it was the first game we had ever done. So we got pretty lucky, I think, in terms of how well it came out, but, you know, but the odds were sort of stacked against it. And um, the team, you know, was really enthusiastic about doing a game like that. You know, and time had evolved, and the team was much more. We had done a bunch of games together, and we were, you know, we had a stable technology base, and we were like, okay, well, let's. Which the which System Shock Two was not. I mean, that engine, yeah. very, no game had ever shipped on that engine. It was a very crude piece of technology. Most of us had never shipped a game at the time. So, like, well, what if we had a stable technology base, and we had a team that was more experienced and more seasoned, and we had, you know, an actual, like, our director, and you know, which we didn't really have on System Shock Two. You know what? What could we do? And so I think there was a lot of enthusiasm in the team to really try to do a more mature version of that kind of game. You know, we, this is before we had sold the company to Take Two, and we were an independent developer, right? We were sitting there. We were using the money we made from 
other development deals we had, and we would try to scrape together whatever time and money we had to work on this thing. And it was not actually something I was particularly keen on doing. The team was much more keen on doing a, a sort of a, a System Shock-ish game than I was because- That's your pitching, right? Like System Shock 3 at one point, right? Well, I, I mean, there was an actual System Shock right. 3 that we were pitching okay. back in the day when we were right after System Shock 2, but that never happened. Right, yeah. um, we couldn't get, couldn't get anybody interested because System Shock 2 sold like five copies, right? Okay. And so as the business guy, the guy who had to not only just sort of write the content, but the guy who had to go out and get the deals and pay everybody, I wasn't particularly excited about doing this because it was very disappointing when we did System Shock 2 and nobody bought it. You know, it got great reviews. It got these insane reviews, and but it left us in a place where we, we it didn't really move the needle for us in terms of making payroll. So I wasn't super excited about it because I didn't see how it, I didn't see a publisher be interested in it, and I didn't see the audience actually be particularly interested in this kind of game. And it was really the team who convinced me to invest in this because their enthusiasm, I think a lot of them came to the studio because of System Shock 2. And so finally, they, you know, they sort of battered me down. And you know, it's good they did because I, 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 was, I was not the first fan of, of doing this. And I know initially there was something called the Serene Dawn. Was that, that was a spaceship the or what was that? No, that was the, the name of a cult, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. That one's, I think, been lost to the. If I remember correctly, Serene Dawn was a cult. You were playing as a deprogrammer that was infiltrating the cult, and your name happened to be Carlos Coelho, who was our one of our programmers yeah. at the time. <laughs> it's named after him. Yeah. Then there was a story notion that I always really found interesting, which was that you have these cults, and you have sometimes people who they're these sort of characters who are really live on the edge of of the gray morality which is these guys who come in and essentially kidnap people out of these cults or rescue them depending on how you look at it because what you really it really is from a functional standpoint it's a kidnapping right you're coming to an adult and you're saying you know you're hired by their parents or whoever and this was in the story it was like a senator whose daughter was joined one of these religious movements called the Serene the Serene Dawn, you said? Yeah, yeah it's it's Serene Dawn. Dawn. Yeah. And, and, and I always thought that was a really interesting tension of yeah. this hero who's basically a kidnapper and taking a young woman against her will out of the place that she was in. Now, you could ar also make the other argument that, well, she was not really there by her will. But there's a really interesting conversation that goes on there. I think there was actually a Kate Winslet movie a Harvey Keitel, Kate Winslet movie, which dealt with a similar theme, because um, usually you hear that story, you know, these deep, these deprogrammers as a sort of heroic kind of notion. But I always thought that well, there's something, something interesting about agency going on there, and about who's are people entitled to make bad mistakes, or you know, or is it a bad mistake? It all depends on the person. You know, and I'm not a fan of you know religious cults or religion in general, but it, it, there seemed to be an interesting uh, discussion of of freedom there and, and independent decision making. And I, I thought that idea was cool, and um, and that was sort of the basis of it for a while. But it was really mostly for the purpose of we needed something to go out and pitch to publishers, uh -huh. and so we know we didn't have a ton of time to really develop it. So that sounded like all right, this will do for now. And was that was that pre Underwater City? I mean, this was just like an idea for a story. And we may have stepped away from that to do the cult thing, but then we went back to the to the Underwater. And we had that one room, remember? We had the one World War II room with the. Um, Roaches on the ground and like these weird test tube things that you could walk around. I, yeah, I don't know where that fell. It could have been underwater. There was no windows. The thing, <laughs> is, the thing is, we were a small business, right? And we were trying to like figure out a way to sell this thing with the with the, spending the least amount of money because we didn't have any money. We, yeah. we, we don't we have a pot to piss in. So we would do this demo that was one room basically just to show, and I'd write up a document. And we'd take it around. I'd fly around yeah. the country, like here's our room. Uh, it was a different time, you know. Yeah. And, well, we had um, just come off of a uh, SWAT 4. One of the advantages we had is that we were so familiar with that engine at that point that we could really start cranking through, you know, small rooms and lighting and, and making things look good. So. so I took it on the road yeah. to sell it to somebody and nobody cared. We'd go to a publisher and look, they have to make money, right? And then we'd say, and, they, and we'd say, oh, it's sort of a spiritual successor to System Shock 2. And they'd be like, well, how did that sell? And I'd be like, my mom likes it, you know, yeah. um, and they would be like, well, we can't, you know, and they, usually we'd be talking to a fan. A lot of executives, like sort of junior executives, were fans of System Shock, and they re and they'd go to their boss, and they'd be super excited, 
and their boss would open up, you know, their Excel spreadsheet and be like, no, we can't do this. And we, I think the pitch probably evolved as we kept trying different permutations trying to sell, but we're also out there trying to sell like two or three other things at the time. We had a pitch for a game called Monster Island and... Um, yep. Well, our SWAT 5 pitch was... Oh, the, oh Zombie SWAT. Yeah, we, we had just come off of SWAT 4, which is like hardcore tactical, and we decided they wanted us to do another SWAT and we didn't really want to do another hardcore tactical game, so we're like, what if we added zombies to SWAT? Like, and this you're a SWAT team that fights zombies and werewolves. That sounds awesome. And it's like, no, it doesn't. And this is before, this is <laughs> we're like not gonna before do that. zombies were a thing. Yeah. We were, yeah. And so we came up with this thing called Division 9. Division 9, yeah. That probably would have been even a bigger financial success than, than Bioshock. Wow. But we couldn't get anybody interested in it. Um, we didn't have enough werewolves in the demo, yeah. I think. We had zero werewolves yeah. in the demo. Yeah, we're going to have werewolves, aren't we? Werewolves and vampires. So <laughs> oh, whole, really? Yeah. Yeah. Werewolves yeah, the whole, like, zombies? Just throw it all, yeah. all the Universal Studios monsters from, like... <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Um, so what happened was is we couldn't sell it, but we were always sort of independent-minded. And so I said, well, what if we sort of did this in reverse? Instead of getting a publisher first and then going doing a press tour on it, what if we sort of did the press first? Sure. And we called up a guy, Andrew Park, at, uh, who's at GameSpot oh, at the right. time, who was a fan of System Shock 2 and a, and a great guy. And he was, I said, well, will you come out and look at this thing we're doing and write a story on it? And he was like, sure. And Andrew flew out and we showed him what we had, which is this very, you know, yeah. very rudimentary thing about an underwater base. And he wrote up an article and sort of featured it as that this is a spiritual successor to System Shock 2. And the next day, the phone started ringing from publishers who now all of a sudden saw the, the article was getting all this pickup and all these comments and people were excited. And that really, I think, put it over the top in terms of being able to sell it, even though it was not Bioshock at that point. It was called Bioshock, but it was yeah. not Bioshock. It, it, there would have been no, I don't think there would have been a game. We never would have sold it without Andrew coming out doing that. My belly is full. 